Hello. Hello. Welcome to the very exciting session of LAL. I'm Linda, and I'm very lucky to be a librarian working across all Kirklees libraries. Last week, we had such a treat. We had author Laura Mutcher and illustrator Anna Peck. Together, they've produced an amazing picture book, Rita's Rabbit. Laura read her story so wonderfully about a little girl, Rita. All Rita wants for her birthday is a rabbit. But when, Re when her birthday arrives, um, grandfather presents her with a bearded dragon. The book has themes of identity and friendship and a mes message that even though we don't always get what we want, sometimes we get something much better. Hannah is an author herself and has illustrated the book with charming characterful drawings and after the reading showed us how to draw rabbits in her own individual style. As always, if you missed uh, last week's fun and exciting session then um, or any of the previous sessions, you can always catch up on our YouTube channel on Facebook and on Twitter or you can catch up here at www.kirkleeslibraries.co.uk forward slash lal. Now I know all young readers will enjoy Rita's Rabbit. We librarians will be reading it um, in, our, in all our libraries and don't forget that you can borrow the book from the library and read it over and over again. And if you uh, like to send in your drawings of Hannah's Rabbits then ask a grown-up to email them to lal at kirklees.gov.uk that's our email address and we'll put them on our website. Now, let's get this next bit ready. Uh, now, uh, this week, I'm so excited to be talking to Darren Simpson. Darren writes vivid, unruly fiction for older children. He's also a literacy champion for Read on Nottingham and loves visiting schools to nurture passion for reading and writing. His debut novel, Scavengers, was a Guardian Best Book of the Year and was selected for the National Summer Reading Challenge and shortlisted for the Northern Ireland Book Award. His latest book is The Memory Thieves. It's aimed at 11 to 14 year olds. And it's a book that fills the gap between middle grade and YA. And although it's, it's, it fills that gap, I would recommend it to anyone for young and also older adults. As with all the books that I've had the pleasure of reading and talking about, I absolutely love Darren's book. Darren says that writing is the most fun you can have alone without a spoon and a bowl of cake mix. So that got me thinking. As a child, my brother and I used to take turns at scraping mum's bowls when she'd been baking on baking days. And scraping the bowl of Christmas cake mix is always a tradition in my house. And that's just for me. So let's meet Darren and talk about cake mix and unruly fiction. And this I forgot to hold up. This is his lovely book. The Memory Thieves there. So as I say, let's go and meet Darren and find out about unruly fiction and cake mix. Hi Darren. Hi there Linda. Unruly Good fiction morning. and cake mix. Explain the cake mix. Well the cake mix uh, is um, simply, well it's just awesome isn't it? I mean cake's great, we all love cake. But there's something special, I think, about um, my wife has got to bake in quite recently. And there's, when you get that kind of big bowl and you get the big kind of mixer and stuff, and you get to sort of lick, lick it all clean and get your spoon in there. It's just awesome. I, I kind of almost prefer the mix to the cake sometimes. It's like when you get brownies <laughs> and cookies. I was like the cookies, the brownies, when they're somewhere between solid and liquid almost, where they're so gooey that they're pretty much not really even baked. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got, I've got a real soft spot for very, very soft cake forms, I guess. So yeah, I do love it. I do love cleaning a um a, a cake bowl. My boys do as well. We always we always yeah, share, you know, in a hygienic there's, way. There's definitely something about it. It's, it's, Chris, it's the Christmas cake one that I like. I'm always um licking the bowl at Christmas cakes. Um, so before we talk about memory thieves, I wondered if I could just ask you to tell us a little bit about your debut novel, novel which was Scavengers. Um, I thought it was a bit stick of the dump, a bit jungle book and a bit American post-apocalyptic action thriller, something about, you know, the long, along the lines of I Am Legend. Um, but it was, I really enjoyed it, really enjoyed it. And uh, and I've, I've, um, I would recommend it to anybody to read either before or after this one, depending uh, on, on how you, you feel about them. So um, could I ask you just to tell us a little bit about that one? Because I guess you, guess you had lots of fun writing that. Yeah, thank you, Linda. I'm really glad, really glad you enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, this, I mean, this is, um, it's actually quite a different, uh, The Memory Thieves is quite a slick 
almost science fiction story, I guess, really, while Scavengers is a much ickier, kind of grotesque, kind of uh, grubby story. And, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned Stick of the Dump, because uh, basically, well, it's about this boy here who's called Landfill. And he's a feral boy, which means that he's kind of, um, he's uncivilized, if you want to use that word, he's, he's wild. And he's, he's grown up with wild animals, that's, what, that's, that's why he is the way he is. And he hides out with a guardian called Babku in this place called Hinterland. I'll get this close to the camera. As you see, it's like a junkyard jungle book vibe here. We've got all the rubbish, all this decay and rotten ruin. But there's also all these flowers and butterflies and birds and wild animals. And there was definitely a Jungle Book influence. I did draw a lot upon Mowgli and the Jungle Book's themes of kind of animals being more civilized than humans, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. I guess. And uh, Landfill hides out with Babagoo in Hinterland. It's a walled off area from outside, which is beyond the wall, because Babagoo says that outside is full of outsiders who have a disease called the hunger. And he says they're rotting inside. And if they got hold of Landfill, they'd do terrible things. So Landfill spent his whole life growing up within the walls of Hinterland. And in this story, um, Landfill has reached the age, he's probably around 11, 12, the sort of age where a lot of children start to realise that not everything their parents say quite adds up, that maybe they're starting to form their own opinions on things. And this is very much about uh, a book about Landfill starting to break Babagoo's very strict rules to find out more about outside for himself. And that, that, that's the goal of the book, to make children think about the walls that are built around them, either symbolic or real and to look over them and, and be brave and make up their own mind and not hate something because they're told to hate it and not fear something because they're told to fear it. So basically it's, it's quite a big theme there, but it's a, it's essentially a very grotty adventure story, a bit of a mystery book as well. Well, I would recommend it to anybody. I found it really exciting and really interesting. Um, so if you have any questions for Darren, as, as usual, uh, please type them into the chat box and I'll be able to ask them after his presentation. But I'm so excited to be able to hand over to Darren now because Darren's going to read for us from the Memory Thieves. Is that so okay, Darren? I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Linda. Yes, so the Memory Thieves then. So uh, I'll give a, a bit of a gist about the book first before I start the reading so you've got some context. But basically, uh, the Memory Thieves is, uh, you can see it's a very unusual setting here. It's like all these sandbanks and dunes and rusting boats and whale skeletons. It's set on a place called the Island of Elsewhere, which is a remote, mysterious island where the tides only ever recede, leaving this landscape of like whale skeletons and abandoned boats. And it's also based in this building here. This, this cube-shaped building is called the Elsewhere Sanctuary. And it's a high-tech facility where children like Ruby and Cyan here have gone to have bad memories of their past lives removed. And they live quite contented lives there. They ride around on quad bikes. They've obviously lost their bad memories. They've got nothing to worry about. And they explore the ships and they, you know, they have a lot of fun there. But one day, Cyan finds a warning carved into the bones of a whale skeleton, which suggests to him that something is amiss at the sanctuary, that maybe it's not as good as it seems. And following that, there's a new resident, a girl called Jonquil comes to the sanctuary to have her bad memories of her past life removed. But she starts reacting badly to the treatment there, which is handled by Dr. Haven, who runs the place. And um, <clears throat> she decides she wants to hold on to her memories, even if they're painful. And she gets handled quite firmly by the sanctuary. And this all basically sets Sion on a mission to find out the truth about the sanctuary, what's really going on there. And also the truth about himself, because he, like everyone else, all the other children and teens there, he's forgotten why he's there. He's forgotten the bad memories that kind of made him go there for a better life. So it's a mystery book. It's sort of a sinister science fiction mystery, I'd say. So I'm just going to read the very first chapter. It's not too long uh, to give you a flavour of the book, I guess. And um, yeah, I should mention that uh, rather than being split into parts and chapters, uh, this book is split into treatment phases and doses. So it's treatment phase A is where we're starting. And then dose one is called tall bones. because it's quite a medical theme to the book, kind of a therapeutic uh, theme as well. I'll just wet my throat and I'll have a read. <clears throat> okay then, dose one, tall bones. Cyan sat back against a huge curving rib he was surrounded by a boundary of bone, a whale's yellowing skeleton stranded in the sand. His creased uniform stood out against the dunes like a green bottle on a deserted beach. Taking a book from his satchel, Cyan found his page and plucked out his bookmark. 
he began to read and was a few pages in when he heard a throbbing in the air. He swept his white fringe from his tortoise shell glasses, got up and peered through a gap between some ribs. Apart from outcrops of rock and some stranded rusting boats, the landscape was all sandy knolls, topped here and there by patches of beach grass. Sion's gaze rose and he found the sound source. An orange blip was cutting through the sky, coming in from the south and heading for the sanctuary. As the chopping of rotor blades sharpened, the helicopter took shape. The lights on its underbelly winked against a backdrop of cloud. A muffled beep came from the pocket of Sion's green trousers. He reached in and pulled out a small silver locket. With its chain still clipped to his trousers, he opened it up and read the message on its screen. Miss Ferryman's office, ASAP. Cyan sighed and slipped his bookmark back into his book. While grabbing his satchel, it knocked a clump of sand from a rib and something caught his eye. He paused, then got onto his knees to brush more sand away. Something had been scratched low into the bone. Tiny words, careful and deep. Best to deceive the memory thieves. Between green and red, fight, don't forget. S7270. Cyan frowned. In all the time he'd spent at these bones, he'd never noticed this. The etched words and numbers were strange. Half of them didn't mean anything, and those that did sent an uncomfortable flutter through his stomach. Memory thieves, fight don't forget. Cyan brooded on the words while putting his book back in his satchel. Turning away, he left with the whale's parted jaws and mounted the quad bike parked on some nearby beach grass. Cyan slapped on some goggles and flicked the ignition switch. All silence was lost to the engine's loud growls. A twist of the throttle sent him racing across dunes. His blazer and shirt flapped wildly in the wind and the hurtling quad spat sand in its wake. He could see his destination up ahead, breaking the sandscape's monotony, the green hills and a grassy cove. To his right, he saw several ships, half buried and clustered around juts of rock. Some of the boats had tipped onto their sides with their tall masts tilting towards the ground. The clouds parted and sunlight hit the wrecks, causing the salt in their rust to sparkle like diamonds. Cyan grinned at the sight. He could taste the salty grit that hit his teeth. Revving the engine, he launched himself over another dune and laughed giddily when the quad landed with a thump. Up ahead, two stone piers stretched like pincers from the cove's harbour. Tucked within the cove was the elsewhere sanctuary, a vast cube of white concrete popped with rows of large porthole windows. Cyan passed the lighthouse on the eastern pier's tip. Its black and white spirals were thick but flaking, and its lantern panes were hidden behind slats, just as, the, as they'd been for as long as he could remember. He revved the quad up the wide cobbled ramp that led from the sand to the harbour's raised bank. A fellow resident leapt aside as he flew over the ramp's top. Cyan hit the brakes, swerving to a stop before grinning at his friend. Ahoy, Teal! Teal grimaced and threw both hands into the air. Can't you watch where you're going, Cyan? Cyan laughed. Can't you watch where I'm going? Teal yanked off his wire spectacles and, after wiping them clean with his own green blazer, pinched the tape wrapped tightly around their bridge. Worst driver on the island, I swear. Your quad's throwing dirt all over the place. He put the glasses back on and started scratching his neck and afro. It's in my shirt and hair and ah, everywhere. Lighten up, lighten up, joy boy. You've been here however long, and you're still bothered by a bit of sand. I hate the sand. You love it. Gives you something to moan about. I've got you, Cyan. I'll always have something to moan about. Cyan clicked his fingers. Hey, did you see the helicopter come in? Heard it land. Teal gestured over his shoulder to the hangar next to the sanctuary. Cyan could see the helicopter on the hangar's roof, motionless and gleaming on its helipad. Teal shrugged. Probably just bringing in medical supplies or something. Supplies come with the hovercraft. I think it's a new resident. Cyan flicked dirt from his blazer's double striped cuffs, then pulled his locket from his pocket. I got a message from Miss Ferriman. I've got to see her. Maybe I'm doing a new resident's induction. Teal shook his head. I doubt it. We had Peter come in just the other day. New residents don't come in that often. I don't know. There's always someone else who wants to forget. Cyan slowed as he spoke, thinking back to the words he'd seen carved into bone. His eyebrows began to sink. Teal shook his head again. Nah, not today. Cyan's grin returned. You're so sure of yourself. Okay, tell you what, 
I'll bet you it's a new resident. Oh yeah, and what you bet? Tonight's pudding. Teal mulled this over and began stroking the small pot of his belly. Deal, but don't whine when I'm eating your afters. Ditto, sometime somewhere. Cyan doffed an imaginary cap, then shot across the harbour to whip through the hangar's double doors. The quad snarls echoed across steel walls until Cyan parked by some other bikes and killed the engine. He hung his goggles on the handlebar and hopped off his seat. Smells of diesel and cool metal filled his nose. Two mechanics were tinkering with the orange hovercraft that filled the hangar's bulk. Cyan saluted when they looked at him from behind massive twin propellers, then left the hangar and made for the sanctuary. Hopping up the marble steps that scaled the staff floor and led to the sanctuary's entrance, Cyan paused to murmur beneath his breath. S7270, between green and red, fight don't forget. The words bothered him, though he couldn't put his finger on why. A sudden flush of heat had him loosening his collar. He shook his head as if shaking the words away and, after stamping sand from his plimsolls, forced the spring back into his step. And with a push of the revolving door, Cyan entered the Elsewhere Sanctuary. Wow. Wow. Now, if you don't want to go and get that book and read it, I just don't know what else to say. It's absolutely amazing. It's a fantastic book. It starts off with such a, a lovely picture that you, that you create. And then it goes into the middle section. And then it goes into the end, which is a really exciting section. It, it builds and builds that book. It's fantastic. And a lot of books have a kind of a, you know, it builds through the book. And then when it gets to the end, it's a bit of a mm, bit of a flop for the end. But the end is so exciting. It's so good. I can't recommend it enough. Um, thank you. Thank you. And so, and so wonderfully read. It's lovely when the author reads their book because you put all that emotion into it and all the, you know, all the gestures for the, for the children. I'm not going to say anything else because I don't want to take up your time. So um, I believe now you've got a little, you're going to tell us a little bit about why, why the book was created and what it was made, uh, how the, you know, the inspiration for it. Is that right? That's right. I thought I'd maybe talk a bit about how the book was inspired uh, and kind of what I was trying to do with it. And then after that, I've got another short reading, uh, shorter than that one, uh, a slightly tenser section from the book a bit mm. later on. Good. And uh, then I believe we're doing a bit of a q and a is that right? That's right. Yes, we've got some questions for you and hopefully we'll have some questions coming in. I've got my comments open and ready for watching for questions. So if you have any questions for Darren about his book or about his journey of writing or anything like that that you think about as we're going through. Um, I know it's, it, I, I know how the book was. Um, I know the inspiration behind the book and it's just it's wonderful when you when you tell this story. So I'm not going to hold you up anymore. I'm going to um, we're going to we're going to get your um, screen up now to share your slides, is that right? Share your pictures? Uh, well, uh, I'll be talking mostly, and there's about three slides as I go through to show that. I'll, All right. I'll them yep. up now. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. fine. In that case, it's over to you again. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I'll go right to the beginning, really. So I guess, I don't know, two and a bit years ago, I was, I'd finished Scavengers, and I was thinking about what to write next, and something happened while I was driving my uh, son home from a swimming lesson. <clears throat> I'm going to get a picture now to show you what happened, okay? Just bear with me one moment, okay? Hopefully, you can all see my poor old red car, yeah? And this is what happened. I was driving my uh, son, my eldest, home from swimming. Uh, a drive that I do very regularly, a drive I do very comfortably, maybe too comfortably, because I wasn't paying attention at some point, and there was a car just ahead of me that uh, stopped to take a turn right, and I'd noticed it too late. I must have been daydreaming. Maybe I was trying to think of new ideas for our next book. But I hit the brakes. I wasn't. I didn't hit them hard enough, and I slammed into the back of this car, and this picture is what mm. happened. Our car was written off. We had to get a new one. Um, I'll stop sharing this picture for now. Um, yeah, so that's what happened, and um, <clears throat> well, obviously, it, it could have been a lot worse. Luckily, my son was fine. He had a very slight bruise from the seatbelt, but he was fine. Um, and the people in front in the car in front of me, they were fine. Um, they were on their way to church, as it happened, and they were a bit peeved off, understandably. I'd hit the back of their car, uh, but in the long run, they were very gracious. So, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for more, really. I'd made a terrible mistake, but everyone was so kind about it, you know, and everyone was alive, everyone was well, so fantastic. But even with all that, I still felt 
so bad. Uh, I've never crashed a car before. Uh, and I'm not a very comfortable driver anyway, but when I crashed that day, it was it was just a real blow to me. And I remember getting really down, probably more down than I have been for, for a long, long time. And it was just a self-esteem thing, really. I just felt like, a, frankly, I felt like a bit of an idiot. It was just such a silly mistake to make. And I was obsessed with how much worse it could have been. I was, thinking, I was, I was hard on myself. I was thinking, Darren, you weren't paying attention there. And you could have killed your son. You could have hurt someone. I, you know, and I was obsessing with this. And every time... I woke up in the mornings after it happened. Uh, I could almost feel the crunch of the cars hitting. And I just, the first thing I remem remember waking up was like what had happened and the situation I was in. And it was just horrible. And I think I, was, I started to punish myself a bit. I remember drinking a little bit more than I would do perhaps normally. And I remember not going out so much because I guess I felt like I didn't really deserve to see friends for a while. Um, so yeah, I was being really hard on myself. Too hard now, I can see looking back. But at the time, that's just what happened. I couldn't help it. And I was amazed at how my self-esteem was way more fragile than I'd ever imagined it was. Really, I thought I was fairly kind of stable and strong, but a lot of us aren't really when it comes to being tested. That's partially what this book is about. So, um, but the thing that I learned, the good thing that came out of this though, is that finally, eventually, I started talking to my wife about just how bad I really felt. She knew I was having a hard time, but I, I had a good talk to her about it. And I talked to friends about it. And the effect of doing that was just amazing because um, I just started to recover thanks to talking to other people. And um, when I talk to friends or even acquaintances in the school run, dropping off my sons at school, you know, I tell them what happened and they go, oh yeah. And they tell me about something similar they had happened when they crashed their cars or when they made a silly mistake or when they felt bad about something. And just having these chats, uh, just knowing that everyone makes mistakes, just knowing that people don't judge you and forgive you, uh, you know, the kindness of other people, it makes you kinder to yourself. And it was only because of, you know, the love of my wife and these friends helping me out that I started to, get better after that crash I started to feel better and sort of forgive myself I guess and move on and um it was a really interesting experience for me and I thought okay I don't know what my next book's going to be but I know what I want it to do I know what the theme's going to be I decided there and then that I wanted to turn this horrible experience into something good into a book and I wanted to have readers of any age get the message from the book that um Basically, if you're feeling bad, talk about it. It's that simple. It's a really simple thing, but not everyone does it for their, for many reasons, I guess. But um, it often helps. Talk to loved ones if you're suffering, if you've got any worries. Talk to people you trust. Um, and if, if that's not helping, you can talk to professionals. There's advice in the book about that as well. But basically, that was my theme. I want to write a book that encourages children, that shows them the importance and benefits of dealing with pain, with confronting it, being honest to yourself and being other, honest to others so they can help you. So that was the theme. And it was on, um, I didn't know quite how to do it, but I knew that I wanted to do it in a way that wasn't too obvious, that was a bit unusual, like the scavengers, I guess. So uh, I was on a camping trip on the Yorkshire coast with my um, family. And um, while we were, in, we were in the seaside town of Staithes, just for ice cream and stuff and the beach. And I remember the sun was going down one night and the tide was going out. And as we were leaving the beach, I looked at the water, the tide going away and I thought, what would it look like if the tide never came back? And I just had this vision of kind of all these kind of all this stuff that would be exposed, all these animal bones and skeletons and things, all the seaweed, uh, and I thought rusting ships at the bottom. And I just really liked this landscape. Um, I just thought, it, hey, it looked cool. Simple as that. I love a cool looking landscape. You know, as, as a writer, it's a great thing to play with. And also for me, I thought, what if I set my story on an island where people have gone to hide away from their bad feelings, to hide away from their bad memories. This idea of water kind of being on an island and the water's always going further and further away, it's almost as if the world is receding from you. And for me, that felt really symbolic and a really great way to A, have a nice landscape and B, have a symbolic landscape that kind of suggests this slipping away of the real world, this kind of escape from your from your old life. So it kind of went from there. Um, and I decided I'd set the island set the book on an island um <clears throat> so i started researching places that uh, might actually look like this place it's i i find a lot of help comes from pictures of uh, scenes like when i wrote scavengers i did a lot of research on real landfill sites and dumps and industrial wastelands so with memory fees i thought i'd better find some pictures of a place where the sea has receded i wasn't sure if such a place exists if the sea recedes and never comes back um but it does sadly um and i've got another picture to show here Get the next one up. Uh, 
OK, so hopefully you can see this picture of two rusting boats on some dunes. Now, this is a place called the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan. And basically, uh, it was an inland sea. It was one of the biggest lakes in the world. Uh, uh, but what's happened over recent years, it's been it's been um, the sea has been shrinking, basically, uh, due to uh, you know climate change and pollution and industrial irrigation mainly. mainly. And it's an environmental disaster, as you can see from these boats. These are fishing boats. There was a community that lived on this sea and they fished there and they made their livings. And as the sea receded, they started getting ill from all the salt levels in the ground. Obviously, they can't fish. And it's a real tragedy. Um, but I mean, um, I did kind of use a lot of pictures of the Aral Sea like this one to inspire my setting. I just love the atmosphere of this place. Um, it's so desolate, um, again, which seems kind of quite appropriate for the idea of a book that is about ex escaping the real world, escaping your feelings and memories. It's quite desolate, isn't it? But at the same time, I thought it would be quite a cool place for children in a way, because I thought, what about if, um, you know, I give them as a place to hang out, you could explore these boats, you can explore the dunes. It's like a trip to the seaside, but a very surreal one. And all of this was really appealing to me. Um, well, sorry, that picture isn't, it's not time for that just yet. Um, so, um, so yeah, I have the Aral Sea. I use a lot of pictures of this place to guide the landscape of the island of elsewhere. And the great thing, and I was getting excited by now, you know, I had a theme, I had a setting. Uh, all I needed now was like the story and the people. And uh, the great thing about building a setting, about writing in general, is the, the, the immense power you have to do anything. You know, your imagination is your limit. And so I got this place, the Aral Sea. I called it the uh, island of elsewhere. I made the tides always recede. And uh, I thought, you know, quad bikes are awesome let's have the children who live in this place get by on quad bikes what about transport hovercraft i love hovercrafts they're, fan they're just such fascinating vehicles i thought i'd have a hovercraft to take supplies in and out of the island and then obviously how else can you get around with all that sand a helicopter why not chuck a helicopter in there so i was already having lots of fun building this setting and also um this is a picture of the Costa Concordia, which is a cruise ship that sunk a few years ago. Uh, I think the captain wasn't paying attention or something and it sunk uh, against some rocks. And um, I thought, wow, you know, I could even get a giant cruise ship on this island for the kids to explore. So I, I did. I got a cruise ship. But rather than just having it resting on the dunes, I tilted it on um, on like a, on the edge of a chasm. So the kids kind of it's like a slope you have to climb up. And the kids also there's a scene in the book where the kids they, they go in um, lifeboats and they slide down the top deck you know past all the bars and swimming pools and stuff and again it's just so surreal but it was so delicious to me uh, and so strange and yeah so I kind of had quad bikes and helicopters and a, and a cruise ship and also animals um I put lots of weight you might remember from the start of the story um sign is sat next to some whale boats there's quite a few whale skeletons around the island which are like climbing frames for the kids and they're shelter and they hang out there so just all this stuff that uh, really good stuff that I was liking so in the end, uh, I'll close this uh, picture. So yeah, I, I kind of, it snowballed from there. I had this setting and I had an idea of a place where children and teenagers would go to have their bad memories removed. And I uh, built this uh, place here called the uh, Els Elsewhere, bear with me, the Elsewhere Sanctuary. This is the clinic where they go to have their bad memories removed. And uh, the characters will, you know, sign a little bit from the start of the book. You'll meet some of them in the next reading, but, um, the characters are there and um, uh, what else? Oh, sorry, bear with me. Um, so, yes, of course. So I had the setting. I had the Elsewhere Sanctuary and had the characters. But I need to think about the treatment. What sort of treatment is going to uh, wipe characters' memories? So I did a lot of research into real life memory removal methods. And believe it or not, that is a thing uh, that is being researched because some people, for example, uh, soldiers, people who've had traumatic experiences, they've got memories that haunt them for the rest of their lives, that stop them from being able to function in society properly. So lots of clinicians and uh, scientists and doctors explore memory removal and memory manipulation. And there are things like um, drugs uh, that can help, uh, uh, you know, drugs and sort of, uh, you know, therapy and stuff. But there is actually a real method that can actually affect your memories. And I'm going to show a picture which sort, which sort of gives you an idea of that. So bear with me again. So this is a picture from a TV show called the Pri a TV show from the 60s called The Prisoner, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
But um, this chair here, imagine a much comfier version of this chair, okay? And that's what I call the strobe chair, which Dr. Haven uses in the Elsewhere Sanctuary to treat the children, to remove their bad memories. And that's based on some real research. So basically, when you make your memories, um, they kind of, um, they form in your mind and they solidify. And every time you revisit those memories, they become a bit flexible for a while. And then when you leave them, they go hard again. And that's why sometimes we remember things differently to how they happened, because memories are actually flexible. And these doctors found that they were making some uh, participants in these experiments remember lists of things. And then they found that if they made people remember the lists while giving them electroshocks, those shocks, not in a painful way, more of a sort of uh, disturbance, those shocks kind of unsettled the memory and stopped it from forming properly. And they found that they could weaken memories by applying these shocks, this association between a memory and a shock. And that's what I based the strobe chair on. So if imagine the chair in this picture, it's a much comfier one. You know, Dr. Haven's office is very cozy and lovely. It's a nice leather sort of couch thing where there's a screen right in front of your eye. And, um, and that screen, um, let me just close this again. And that screen shows strobe lights, but those lights, Dr. Haven explains, are actually images based on the trauma that these children have left and that they've gone to the island for to escape from. And every time those uh, images flash, there's an electrical shock. There's no pain, there's lots of medication and stuff involved. And that basically uh, weakens, um, that basically weakens the memories of these children until they're wiped away. And basically the children on this island, they've got no bad memories. They don't remember the old world as such. It's quite abstract to them. You know, they remember things like countries and vehicles and animals and stuff, but they um, it's quite an abstract memory of the world. They just know the island now and they've, they've forgotten all their pain. And they've even forgotten how to cry. That's how extreme the island is. And um, that's why Jonquil was very interesting in the book to the characters. When Jonquil, the new resident comes along, there's a couple of scenes where she starts to cry. And all the children are fascinated because they haven't seen anyone cry for as long as they can remember. So that's how strict the sanctuary is in terms of emotions. And, uh, and memories. And uh, a final thing that uh, inspired the book, I'll just share one last picture. So there's the sanctuary itself, which, meant, which for many people is one of their favorite things about the book. So the sanctuary, uh, it's got the office with the chair I mentioned, but that's not the only thing that helps these children to lose their memories and stay detached from their emotions. So I based the sanctuary on this hotel here. It's called the Maritime, the Maritime Museum, uh, the Maritime Hotel, quite appropriately, in New York. And I took this building, but rather than being this pizza box shape, I made it into a cube. And then I made it a place where the rooms are always shifting. Uh, because for me, I thought that um, basically well, on that same holiday where I saw the tide going away, I got lost in a hotel once in the Grand Hotel in Scarborough. And I was lost in all these back corridors. And I thought this is a really good way to kind of feel disorientated and lose touch with your kind of feelings and emotions. So I thought I'd put that in the book as well. So I got this hotel here, made it into a big cube, and I made the rooms shuffle uh, so that basically um, residents aren't always familiar with where they are. And I use this design here. If you look on the picture on the right here, this is called a badass cube. It's a bit like a Rubik's cube, but rather than sort of tilting and shifting the sort of layers, you push the little cubes around this plastic framework. And that's how this building works. So these children, they live in this building, but every time they think they've got a grip of where they are, where their room is, everything shifts like the blocks in this cube. And it's what the doctor calls disorientation. It keeps them detached from their memories. And even time is vague on the island. So they don't know where they are, the rooms are often in different places. And also the, there's clocks in the sanctuary, but they don't have any hands. So time is vague, space is vague. It's all part of this thing called the Leith method that helps the children to, um, to kind of um, lose their memories and get detached from their feelings. So, I mean, that's basically, there's obviously more to it than that, but this is kind of what I do. I had an idea for a theme and I magpie stuff. So, you know, I saw the tide going away um, and I just grabbed bits from this and that. And I looked up some research into memory removal. And I just got all that and I based the story there, the story which um, you know I told you about earlier on about Cyan, finding a warning that perhaps this sanctuary isn't as good as it makes out and his secret mission to find out what's really going on. So I do hope that gives you a good idea of what it's all about. I've got a short reading now and then I'll get talking to Linda again with any questions you've got. Okay, again, over to you. Okay, I hope that all made sense, Linda. <laughs> it, it, did, it did, it's just I cannot get over the fact that um, the, the, the Memory Thieves book 
we pick it up in a shop we pick it up in a, a, a in a library um it's it's a present it, it's a book it, this is this is this is the product of all that that you put into it all that imagination all that magpie of, of all the things that you've seen and you've done and i just think it's such a wonderful thing that authors do we think books just come from nowhere and we sit there thinking well you know why this why that when you think about and i learned so much about it i mean i went to look at, at the research behind the aral sea because i thought it was such a fascinating thing and i believe that now they're trying to get some of the water back and i think they are trying to they're trying to be able to fish again then but it's such a it's a huge um subject and it just it just you know it, it fed into the book and so many other things all, all feed into this book. I just think it's such a marvelous thing. I'm going to stop now and let you do a second reading because I know this is the that, this is the grip this is the gripping bit. <laughs> that's all right. I mean, that's what I mean. Most authors will, authors will do. They'll take things and they'll adapt them, and you know, things that, that resonate with them somehow, and hopefully resonate yeah. with readers too. And and anyone who anyone who's watching today who's interested in writing, that's I mean, that's often what it comes down to. Get started. You just take stuff you like, take stuff that excites you. Because when you're excited, you're going to care about what you're yeah. writing. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. It won't be a chore. And that's what you do, just take stuff you like and, and see where it goes. That's all I did. That's all I it's just a it's just a blag where you just take stuff you're excited it's, it's, pr it's the process of how, how you build that up. Um and then it, it all comes together. I think it's amazing. Right, okay then. So now we're gonna have our second reading from the memory. Okay, so Thank so you. a bit later on now. Oh, that's all right, Linda. So, so basically, um, this is I've mentioned that cruise ship. So uh, John Quill is joined by Teal, uh, Sion and their friend Ruby. They've been racing down this cruise ship, having quite a good time. And they're sitting down to have some lunch uh, in the chasm where the cruise ship is. And in this scene, <clears throat> John Court is going to try and break one of the rules. She wants to talk about how she's, about her past, which isn't allowed because it might ruin the treatment. So we're going to see what happens as a result of that. Just wet my throat one more time. Okay. A sniff from John Quill. Guys, she began, I can call you friends now, right? Sure, said Ruby. Teal and Cyan nodded. In that case, Cyan managed to look up. Jonquil was kneading her knuckles. Her voice dropped to a whisper. I know it's not allowed, but I was wondering whether you guys would mind if, if perhaps I'd talk about what happened to me, you know, before I came here. Three pairs of eyes widened. Teal tensed, pushing himself into the chair's backrest. No, Ruby's voice was firm. Sorry, Jonquil, you know we can't do that. Jonquil shrugged meekly. I know, but... You're not allowed to talk about your past, interrupted Cyan. No one is. It'll compromise your treatment. You might even compromise our treatment. But no one has to know, insisted John Quill. Tears were gathering on her eyelids. I just feel like, like I need, need to get some of it out. There are things I need to say. Her voice thickened. Things I need to share. Cyan threw his palms up. Don't do this, John Quill. His heart was racing again. He'd never been in this situation before. No one had ever tried to talk about their past. But he knew the rules. He'd have to alert the sanctuary if John Quill kept going and he wasn't allowed to listen. The legs of Ruby's chair scraped backwards through the sand. Teal had a hand on the side of his feet and was raising himself from its base. Sweat glistened from on his forehead. His chest began to quake with panicked breaths. The rules, he whispered. John Quill saw them all shifting. A tear rolled down her cheek. Please listen, she croaked. It happened months ago, just out of Diwali. My mum was... Teal was the first to flee. John Quill stopped when Cyan and Ruby followed suit, knocking back their chairs and sprinting in separate directions. Cyan made, da made a dash for the serenity. He glanced over his shoulder, saw Ruby and Teal running for a rocky mound. John Quill was alone by the fallen chairs, revolving, revolving on her feet to watch the trio scarper. Come back, she wailed, please. But the three of them kept running. Cyan crouched in the shadow of the serenity's keel. He peered around its edge to see Jonquil staggering back and forth, unsure which direction to run in. Mum was driving us home, she screamed. Me and my sister, my beautiful little sister. She fell to her knees, but continued to wail. Mum was in a bad mood, because we'd... Sign threw his palms against his ear. We could still hear Jonquil's dull screeching. He pushed an ear against his shoulder and used his free hand to yank his locket from his trousers. After thumbing it open and pressing its screen, he held it to his mouth and panted, Disclosure! It's Jonquil! Disclosure! He made out a few words that flew from Jonquil's direction, something about an argument, and thrust the locket into his pocket before slamming his palm back against his ear. Cyan wasn't sure how long he'd been waiting before swells of wind began racing along the chasm. 
The air pulsed and howled, and he peeked around the keel to see Jonquil standing rigid with her back to him, her long hair flailing in the gale. Up above, the sanctuary's helicopter appeared at the chasm's mouth. Its steady descent whipped up a storm of salt and sand. Sion could only just make out Mr. Banter as the helicopter's door opened. Jonquil backed away through miniature cyclones. Mr. Banter stepped out casually, brandishing something in his hand. Science squinted through walls of yellow and white. It was some sort of cartridge, rectangular, plastic and pale. Mr. Banter aimed the cartridge at Jonquil and a long needle sprang from its top. Its thin metal winked in the helicopter's lights. Jonquil screamed and turned, but Mr. Banter was too quick. He leapt forward and smothered her head in his giant forearm. A surge of sickness hit Science's stomach. The violence of Mr. Banter's grip sent him out from cover. And as he ran to Jonquil, he saw her eyes, wide and white with terror and betrayal, fall upon him. He continued to run with his arms stretched towards her and cried out when Mr. Banter plunged the needle into her neck. The screaming stopped. Jonquil stiffened, then dropped to hang limply from Mr. Banter's arm. He dragged her into the helicopter and slammed the door shut before it rose through sand and shadows. Cyan fell to his hands and knees. His chest heaved and his ribs felt brittle against his hammering heart. With the helicopter tilting and soaring above them, Teal and Ruby emerged to join him. Ruby's face was rigid with shock. Teal watched the helicopter's tail disappear. He hugged himself tightly, trembling with emotion. The drone of rotor blades faded, leaving only empty sky. How could he? How could he do that? How could he tell? Oh! I was reading that bit. I was thinking, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But he does. It, it's terrible. So that is a, a very gripping place that you've left us there on the on the on uh, with the the boat Serenity in the background. Um, the book's highly original story, and it's it's dark deception and very fierce loyalty. Two things that I that I found coming out of there. I rode such a roller coaster of emotion through every part of the book, um, and I'd like to ask, how do you find the balance of light and dark? when telling such an attention-grabbing thriller? Light and dark, that's a good question, yeah. I've got to admit, my problem is I tend to sometimes, in terms of writing, it's quite fun writing the dark. Um, so I tend to, uh, in early drafts, things are often a bit, maybe a bit too dark, a bit too grisly, and that's why it's good to have an editor who really knows her stuff. Stephanie King is my editor, editor at Usborne, and she's very good at sort of uh, taking my drafts and saying, I love this, Darren, but this bit here and this bit here, remember you're writing for children and um, that, that happens sometimes um so and but i have learned from because i never start off writing for children you see it's something i sort of learned more recently uh, scavengers was for adults originally when i first drafted it and i have now learned that as much as children do enjoy the darkness and they do enjoy a bit of grisliness and stuff uh, they also need that kind of seed of light of hope don't they so mm. now i am careful mm. that like so for example the memory thesis is quite sinister in places quite creepy in places but there's also a lot of camaraderie between the friends there's a lot of kind of i try to put a lot of humorous banter in there between the characters you know uh, a lot of kind of private jokes and um obviously a lot of action and adventure so it's not all dark and serious a lot of it i, I like to think there's quite a bit of fun in there and it does ultimately ultimately have an ending that is kind of hopeful um, so, and yeah, I mean, uh, and obviously since having kind of met a lot of children and having written for them for a while now, I've started to really enjoy striking that balance between darkness and light. And um, I hope I get it right, but because I do tend to err towards the darkness originally, but I think overall the light is the more important bit, but sometimes light is lighter because of the darkness, isn't it? It is, it is. And you mentioned there um, about the, the camaraderie that they've got. I love the way that Cyan is such a flip character. It's, uh, you know, he's, um, when he's talking it's always uh sometime somewhere see you around you know this kind of thing and uh and all the ahoy shipmates and everything so uh, the relationships between the um the characters and how they grow i think is very important the relationship that grows between ruby and uh, and cyan as as uh, as the story unravels are they based are the characters based on anybody you know uh not as such really um you're right though i mean th in this book because of the sort of emotional detachment that all the children have on this setting because of the treatment they are they're kind of friends and they're chummy but they're not exactly close close and i think as the as they find out the, so that there is some sort of peril and they have to work together that's obviously and they sort of start 
you know, skipping on their medication and stuff, they start, the feelings are allowed to grow between them. And that was a fun part to put into the book. Um, but um, yeah, they're not really based on anyone, I think. I think with Sai and I just started with both of them, with all the characters, especially the children, I want them to be people who seem outwardly quite comfortable with themselves and confident, but kind of all hiding worries and fears that they have to keep to themselves, which is what we all have, even the most mm -hmm. confident person. In fact, often the more confident a person is, the more they're hiding, I find, in terms of insecurities and fears anyway. Yes. So they're not really based on anyone particular, but they, they are based a bit on myself and everyone in the sense that, like I say, Sion is very flippant and cheeky and cocky, but he's got fears and doubts he doesn't understand. And then as it turns out, Ruby is kind of gives him as good as she gets with the banter and stuff, but she's also got things that she's worried about. Teal does fret and worry, that character, uh, but he's got some even deeper stuff than that. It's quite, it seems, it's quite surfacey. You know, they're not really based on anyone specific. I tend not to base my characters on real people I know or anything like that. So I kind of just make them up and they kind of grow the way they have to for the story. Why colours, Darren? Why did you give them colours for names? Well, firstly, because if they're on this island where they have to remember, forget their old lives, I thought they'd better forget their old names as well. But rather than give them just like new names like John or Henry and uh, Rachel or whatever, I thought it'd be good to give them something thematic and colours. I mentioned the prisoner earlier on that influenced me, and that's set on an island where, set in a village where no one has their real names, and they're all numbered. So the main character is called number six, and the kind of antagonist is number one. And I kind of drew upon that for the book. So I thought, well, I can't do colours, numbers, that's been done. What about colours? And a lot of colours are you know, used as names already, like Ruby, you know, and Scarlet are names already, mm. that kind of thing. And a lot of colours like Cyan, uh, Teal, Jonquil, they sound to me like nice names anyway. So it felt quite it kind of tied together thematically, I guess. So that's why I went for colours. It, it was a way to remove their old names and just it's a bit of world building as well, isn't it? Adds to the atmosphere, I guess. Yeah, I like that. And it, it's it's like the like you said in, in the when you were discussing the book, the fact that the rooms are shifting. That's a fantastic concept. That adds so much to the book. I've never heard anything like that done before. And it, it all adds to the disorientation that they feel. Um, and um, yeah, and the the, the 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 doffing of the hat that he does, and 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 this this um, what's the word? Differential. Uh, they're so deferential. Deferential oh. is the word I'm thinking of. All the characters are so deferential, um, and so it, the whole setting makes you feel like they do. You you know you, you're in there with the characters, which I think is so wonderful. Um, who influenced you as, as a writer? Who are your influences? Um, I don't have any direct influences in, in the sense of authors that I try to kind of mimic or imitate, I guess. Um, but I, I, I've, all I've got is favourite writers who I try and write as good as while not really doing something too similar. So, mm -hmm. I mean, um, I know he's a, I, I grew up with a lot of Roald Dahl, I guess. I think a lot of that kind of... Um, kind of separating the man from the stories, I guess. But a lot of uh, his stories are quite... Um, I, like, I was like how macabre and dark they are cruel in a way some of his stories but I kind mm. of as as a, as a child I kind of enjoyed that and I think I sort of like writing that kind of thing um I mean I like so many authors in terms of contemporary ones I, I really like um uh, Alex Wheatle for example I've got some sorry book look at the bookshelves Nicola Penfold Alex Wheatle um these are all writers who kind of want me make me want to up my game and you know do my best one writer who actually kind of turned me on to writing in the first place was actually Salma Rushdie, of all people. Um, many years ago, I was thinking about writing. I'd started something very early, very rubbish looking back. And I started reading Midnight's Children well, in bed one night. And I'd never come across a writer who plays so much with... Um, Salma Rushdie kind of does a thing where he tells the story, but he's an unreliable narrator and he changes his mind about the story he's told. And he's quite playful in that sense. And he makes fun of himself as a narrator and... And I, I'd never come across that. And it was really new to me. And I just remember thinking like, wow, I need to up my game. So I think Sam Rushdie was a big person in terms of um, making me think that I should just work hard to do something more interesting. I went to university to study English after that, just because I wanted to, to do a better job of things. And people like Angela Carter, Jeanette Winterson, it's, my taste is really eclectic, but, so there's, but there's no particular writers that I sort of have direct influence from, I guess. Um, Memory Thieves may be an otherworldly adventure, but it's also about very real themes, about very real things, um, emotional, um, emotional evasion, repression, all these these feelings that we have that are really painful feelings that we feel as children, we feel as adults, I don't think ever leaves us. Um, and I learned a lot from the book about myself, about the way that I look at things and the way that I approach things. Um, what do you hope that your readers will take away from The Memory Thieves? Wow. I'm so, thank you, Lynn. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, Major. 
uh, rethink things. That's a that's a big deal. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it really is simple. I mean, the, the dedication at the start of the book is for anyone who's hurting, and that's kind of like you know, uh, it, it's ultimately an adventure, and it's ex hopefully an exciting adventure. But yeah, if I can have children putting this book down and thinking. I'm going to talk to my mum and dad about something I'm worried about that, I haven't, that I've been keeping to myself. You know, if that happens, especially, you know, the pandemic's been taking mm. place and stuff, you know, we've people, a lot, there's so much to worry about right now, I guess. So if it just gets young people, ad adults talking, firstly being honest to themselves and then talking to other people about how they're feeling, so they can work together to kind of make each other feel better. That for me is, that's what the book set out to do. And I actually saw a review on Topster just recently from a, an 11 year old girl that said, um, this book made me realise I need to, talk more about how I feel, thank God for friends. And when I saw that, I just thought, whoa, mission accomplished. Yeah, you know, I was, yeah, really, yeah, I was so done, pleased. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to. I just want people to have a good time reading it, but also come away from it more willing to be open, I guess. I think it's, I think it's, uh, it, that, that comes across in the book very, very strongly. And I think it's such a helpful thing. Um, how important do you think fiction is in education? I mean, you, you do tackle such big, significant issues in the book, not not just the the, the, the mental issues that uh, that young children, mel mental health issues that young children battle with, um, but also the big issues that you introduce into there. I mean, we, we talked about the Ariel Sea, we talked about um, climate change and, and that sort of thing. So do you think that fiction has a part to play in education? Oh, massively, massively. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, well, you know, it's obviously um, schooling. Well, it should. It's 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 all part of the same. Um, um, it's all part of the same thing in a way, isn't it? The same sort of. Um, what's the word? I've forgotten the word now. Like uh, when you get like textiles, and they're all all part of the same. Interwoven. Yeah, so it's all interwoven, yeah. basically. So yeah, obviously, school yeah. The, the sort of classic schooling stuff is important. But you know, reading for pleasure. You know, when you're reading fiction and kids are into it, they're improving their literacy while having a good time while getting into books. And they learn lots from it, and uh, mm. and they're relaxing. Reading is good for mental health, and relaxing helps you learn better at school. Obviously, better literacy from reading helps you apply literacy better at school. So, I mean, it's all part of the same thing, right? Really. So, yeah, fiction I think is a massively, massively. Uh, I mean, if you, if you get kids, if you help kids find books that they enjoy, and you get them to read them, then they're just learning and benefiting so much while sitting in a corner at the weekend, mm. you know, or in big time, you mm. know. And so, yeah, for me. I mean, I'm obviously massively biased, but fiction is a huge, huge important part of education, I'd say. Yeah, and I, I think it's yeah. so lovely that because we've been in lockdown, a lot of children that haven't been reading have, have started to read. Um, but I think one of the things that I hope people will take away from Lal is that we, we are talking to wonderful authors like yourselves, but we're also introducing people to books to, that they might not have found um, and looking at books in a different way. So I think, I think Lal's been very valuable like that now i could go on talking to you till half past three this afternoon but we've got we've just got a lovely comment here that i'd like to put up um book sounds fascinating i love the mag magpie like acquisition of the various elements and i think that's once once you start thinking about what's behind the book you think you can see just what a masterful thing it is that you've done in creating it i think that's wonderful um Right, I'm going to take that off. Now, I've got loads more questions, but I'm conscious that we, we're, we're getting a bit further on here. So you have a challenge for us, um, an activity. Well, I was thinking, could we, yes, could well, we go I mean, into I that, gonna, do you think? Yeah, well, I was thinking, if there's quite a few more questions, I might come perhaps just set the activity rather than go through it, perhaps. Is that an idea? We've got time for a couple more questions. Is that an idea? That's entirely up to you. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. The, the, I'll the do that just to be fair. To the, activity, the activity sounded so fascinating. Yes. Okay. Well, basically, this is something a chance for well uh, for everyone at home to sort of get a bit creative and have some fun. Basically, is what it comes down to. You apply some imagination. So I talked a lot earlier on about how I kind of built the island of elsewhere and how I kind of you know put lots of things and quad bikes and cruise ships into the setting. And my um, my challenge for you guys is to have a go at creating your own. Do a bit of world building yourself, create an island yourself. And I was thinking because not everyone's getting on holiday this summer and obviously we've had a lot of time at home lately and I'd like you to design your own dream island, your dream getaway, somewhere you can um, imagine going and having a good time and relaxing. So for example, and just do what I did, think about what's gonna be there. So firstly, give it a name, then you can give it a shape. I mean, it could be a perfect circle, it could be the initials of your name, give it a shape and then think about what sort of landscape is your favorite 
and then just put that in there. So I'm, I really love woodlands and stuff. So I probably have a very kind of kind of green uh, island full of woodlands. But you can make it. You can have a mix of landscapes in your island. So think about landscape. Uh, so we've got shape, name, landscape. Think also about the weather. Now, this is your dream place. Give it the weather that you love. If you love really hot, sweaty days, like some people do, make it a hot, tra hot tropical paradise. If not, if you like kind of cooler days, like I do, go for that. Think about what's there. What is what is what do, people, what do you do there for entertainment and to relax? So for me, for example, I would definitely have a library, an incredibly cozy library with lots of like, it's just full of those book smells and has a lovely coffee machine and a cafe. Uh, I'd probably have an ice cream cafe that does amazing ice cream. And that's practically all I'd need, really, somewhere to get ice cream, chocolate and books. So, uh, yeah, think about what's there. Think about the people there. Who is allowed to come on your island with you? It could be like your favorite relatives and friends and family, you know, uh, or it could be a place where strangers meet. It could be an island where people get together to socialize and meet new people. So think about that. Um, so, yeah, that's my challenge for you. You know, ha fantasize a little bit about a place you would love to go where everything is perfect for you. And once you've done this, island, basically you can draw it out like a map and label all the stuff that's there and you can write down what the weather's like. And then, you know, you can color it in, make it into a poster, you know, or and if you're feeling really ambitious, if you'd really like to immerse yourself in your island that you've created, you could even write a story based there. You could use it for reference. Uh, you could even write a tour guide there or a diary entry for someone someone who's on the island. So this is a way that you can create something, but then immerse yourself within it. And even though you're not really going away there, this is all just fantasy. I think there's a lot to be said for imagining these things and, and kind of um, having fun in these imaginary places. So yeah, and, and send your results in. Uh, and um, so we can all see your, uh, your, your islands that you build. I'm really curious about what you create. So if you'd like to send those in to us, that's at lal at kirklees.gov.uk. At this point, I normally say get an adult to uh, to email them in, but I'm quite sure that our audience today and readers of the book can do their own emails. Um, it's something that I, I will definitely have a go at. I'll, um, I'll have a think about that one because I think it's a really interesting challenge and a really interesting way of approaching um, writing. The other two things that I wanted to ask you about were, I know that you like to nurture a passion for writing. Um, so I wondered if we could talk about something that I found. It said, um, 12 years ago, I took a train to London to have an agent tell me she loved my book, but wasn't sure where to place it. Um, I went home so forlorn. Can you tell us a little bit about the, that, that is excellent advice. It's very good advice. And it's come up time and time again when we've talked to authors. And you say, long story short, don't give up. So that's very good advice. But can you tell us a little bit about your 12 year journey? Uh, what, yeah, what, so how, basically. What else, have, what else have you written or how did you, how did you manage? Uh, so basically I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I started writing just as I finished university. I went to university a bit late because I wanted to, learn about English and, and to be a better writer, hopefully. And yeah, and I started writing books then, very excited and enthusiastic and keen and hungry. Uh, but then the reality struck me that um, that there is a lot of rejection. When you're trying to get published traditionally by a publisher, um, it's, it's for most people, it's a very long, long road full of rejection. So basically I wrote, uh, that was when I went to London in that from that tweet to meet the agent, but she didn't know what to do with it. And then that ultimately no one took it on, but it did get published sort of in a different way later on, that's a different story. But then, that's why it didn't work out. I wrote a second book, um, again for adults, and that one, uh, it got me an agent, my lovely agent, Laura Susain, but um, it didn't um, it didn't get taken on by any publishers. So after, this is about six years of work already, so you know, two books, uh, so, I, but I had an agent, that was good, I was excited, excited, I thought, I've got an agent, that's, for anyone who's wondering, is the person, you get the writer, and then there's the agent who tries to sell the book to the publisher. And that's often the hardest bit. I thought, well, this is, it's a matter of time now. You know, this book will get taken on. It wasn't taken on. I wrote a third book, which my agent tried putting about. And sadly, again, that didn't work out. So um, by this point, I was close to giving up. It's probably been about 10 years. And I'd had lots of people saying they like it, but lots of buts. And I was depressed. and I, I, I felt like giving up. And my wife told me not to. She knows I get edgy if I'm not writing and stuff. She says, you know, just, just stick to it. And I had no choice. I just, I just had to keep trying, especially after investing so much time already. And then luckily with Scavengers, uh, that was an adult book at first, but my agent said, the most interesting character in this story is the child. Why not try writing it from the child's perspective and we might maybe go to children's publishers? And uh, I did that and it worked. Uh, so, uh, and 
yeah, I mean, the relief was immense. Uh, finally, after after so many years of working hard, my fourth book uh, got taken on, uh, and so the rest is uh, and that's all history, basically. Now I'm just sort of looking forward and trying trying to keep hold of this. What's going on at the minute? Um, but that's it. Yeah, lots, and that's really normal. And my advice really is that if if anyone uh, here starts writing and wants to get published, honestly. Do not be put off by it taking a long time and by lots of rejection because yeah it's it's undeniably painful and hard work but also it's all practice it's all mm. preparation none of it is wasted and i'm glad it took me so long because when i finally got published i had lots of experience i would found my voice as a writer by then mm. i knew a thing or two about writing and i knew a thing, a thing or two about the industry so it's not a bad thing that it took a long time none i'm just saying basically when you try even if, if it goes nowhere, it's not a waste of time. And also hopefully you're having fun while you're doing it because writing is fun. Thank you. I think that's that's really good advice for all our budding writers out there. Um, and, and like you say, you find so I found out so much about yourself and you grow the experience of, of writing. Um, and I think as you go from book to book, you, you, your experience continues to grow. So we're going to look forward to the next one. Right, I'm going to stop with questions now. I'm going to jump through my notes. Um, oh, no, I have one more question. One more question. The last question is, what can we expect from Darren Simpson next? What's your next book? What can I look forward <clears> to? <throat> well, if you, if, you, if anyone out there happens to get uh, Memory Thieves from the library or uh, from a shop, uh, there is actually a sample right at the back uh, from my next book, which is called Furthermore. Uh, it's Furthermore, sort of two O's in, in the more. Mm. Uh, and... Um, yeah, that's uh, out next next year, and that is again quite a different story to Scavengers or Memory Thieves. This one is a more contemporary, normal setting. But having said that, the other half, half of it is also in set in an imaginary world, and it's a story that uh, involves a imaginary uh, clockwork crystal crystalline kind of forest, I guess, and it explores it explores bullying essentially, and explores um, dealing with grief. And again, the importance of talking to people, uh, escapism, the benefits of it and the risks, that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's uh, furthermore coming out next year. So the next question has got to be, will you come back and tell us about that one? I would absolutely love to if you have me. Well, hopefully, because you're in Nottingham, I believe that's not too far from us. So perhaps by the time that one comes out, we might actually be able to invite you up for an author visit to one of our libraries again, like we did with the scavenger. That would be awesome. Darren, it's been amazing this morning. I, I could, like I say, I could talk to you forever. The, the, the book is wonderful. I can't recommend it enough. Um, so um, can I just ask now, where are we? Um, can I just ask, are you happy to stay with us while I talk about what's happening next week? The, this is the bit where we talk about what's happening next week. Um, so next week we are returning to picture books. Get back on track, Linda. Uh, we are returning to picture books with one of our one of our biggest lal favourites. That's the awesome Philip Ardar. So we want you to join us for an hilarious event featuring his picture book, Bunnies on the Bus. So we were bunnies last week and we're bunnies next week. So we, we, we're going back into picture books and more bunnies. Um, so remember your pencil and paper because it's going to be a bunny draw along as well. And I'm just going to let Philip um, tell us all about it himself because he will be able to tell us about next week's episode much more excitingly than I can. So just bear with. Hello, my name's Philip Arda and I'm really looking forward to 11 o'clock in the morning on August the 17th for our Library Adventures Live event all about my book Bunnies on the Bus illustrated by Ben Mantle and I'll not only be reading the book and sharing some of the pictures with you but we'll also have a go at a draw along where I get to draw one of the bunnies and you can have a go too so do have your pencil and paper ready. Let's recap, that's Library Adventures Live, that's 11 o'clock, August the 17th. Look forward to seeing you there. Bye now. Oh dear, that's just crazy, that's just crazy. Um, so don't forget, uh, a children's picture book next week and the, the great Philip Ardow, so come along and watch that. 
Um, if you haven't watched any of the, uh, if you haven't watched a lot of these wonderful programs that we keep making, please go back and watch them. There are some fantastic authors out there. I have read Scavengers, I have read Memory Thieves, and I can't wait for furthermore. Um, if you haven't read these books, then you really are in for a treat. So, oh, we've got something else. We've got an, another comment that I missed. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, at Lal. Author interviews are wonderful. So helpful finding exciting books for children to read. That's 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 what we're here for. That's what we're here for, Sue. So thank you very much for supporting us. Thank you. And the last thing that I have to say then is just thank you so much to Darren for today. Hopefully see you soon. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. And bye-bye from me and Darren. Bye now. <laughs>